So, uh, the first video I did for Band Films Week was about the distinctly British phenomenon of video nasties, featuring a prominent appearance from one Miss Mary Whitehouse and her organization, the National Viewers and Listeners Association. Which, of course, brings up the question, did America have its own homegrown in VALA? And, you know, of course it did. But... You remember how I said Mary Whitehouse was kind of in with the Thatcher administration, giving her organization more power than they probably should have? Well, would you believe the American in VALA was even more powerful than that? First, allow me to set the stage by explaining the early days of American film censorship. There's a lot here I've discussed in passing before, but... Let's just get it all down on paper right here. At the dawn of cinema, there were no rules or regulatory bodies saying what you could and couldn't do on film. Which makes sense, plays and books don't have any major regulations outside of the loosely defined boundaries of obscenity. But as always, the old way hates the new way, and film found itself under some very harsh scrutiny, and studios and filmmakers began to worry about government intervention, particularly after the 1915 Mutual Film Corp vs. Industrial Commission of Ohio case ruled unanimously that the First Amendment right to free speech does not extend to motion pictures. Thus began a series of self-regulatory bodies ending with the Motion Picture and Distributors Association of America, later the Motion Picture Association of America, who would enact a set of guidelines. The Motion Picture Production Code, or the Hayes Code as it was more commonly known, was a list of 11 things never to be shown in film, and a further 25 things to be careful of, penned in 1927 by Catholic paper editor Martin Quigley and Jesuit priest Father Daniel A. Lord, and approved by MPDAA head Will H. Hayes, from whom the code got its name. The code got passed around to various studios, but there wasn't actually any enforcement of it. So while studios knew to remain cautious, filmmakers knew they could still get away with a lot. And would these artists really be doing their jobs right if they weren't pushing at social taboos? So, in 1984, Hayes organized the Production Code Administration, dedicated to making sure everyone followed the code. And that was apparently good enough for the US government, as they never felt the need to regulate movies any further, and the MPAA remains Hollywood's chief regulatory body. But it wasn't good enough for everyone, and they figured if Hollywood and the government weren't gonna fix the problem, they'd do it themselves. At the same time Hayes was putting together the Production Code Administration, Archbishop of Cincinnati John T. McNicholas was putting together his own group in response to the lack of code enforcement. Originally named the Catholic Legion of Decency, the name was quickly changed to the National Legion of Decency as, while the organization was chiefly concerned with upholding Catholic values, they openly called for help from all their Christian brethren right from the start. While early proponents of the Legion encouraged simply promoting positive movies as not to give publicity to those they didn't approve of, very quickly the Legion created their own rating system for films. They had A for approved, C for condemned, and B for morally objectionable in part. Although they would eventually expand A to A1 for all audiences, A2 for older audiences, A3 for adults only, and uh... A4 for adults with reservations, which frankly just sounds like a B. Still, credit where it's due, the Legion may have been overly strict in their ratings, but they had a tiered rating system while the MPAA was still on a dumb pass-fail system. And the Legion wasn't just there to tell Catholic or even just Christian audiences what they should and shouldn't watch. They were out to tell everyone what they could and couldn't watch. The big thing with the NLD was direct action. Protesting movies was one of their biggest moves. Not just boycotting, but encouraging others to stay away as well. Getting condemned by the Legion was essentially a death knell for a film. Most distributors wouldn't even bother showing it, and the few who dared show it weren't likely to turn a profit. I'm not exaggerating when I say studios were terrified of the Legion. If only they had someone to guide them. Hey, remember when I said Hayes put together a committee to better enforce the production code? Well, that committee was run by a man named Joseph Breen, 
the biggest disgrace to the name Breen in film history. Because, wouldn't you know it, Joseph Breen was also a member of the National Legion of Decency. So, suddenly Breen's job became a lot bigger than just enforcing the Hayes Code. You could skirt your way around the code. You couldn't skirt your way around the National Legion of Decency. So filmmakers came to Breen not to make sure they were in line with the Hayes Code, but to make sure they wouldn't get condemned. As a result, most of what actually got condemned was obscure, foreign, or in most cases, both. And it certainly helped that the MPDAA, and by extension, the Legion of Decency, were associated with the Big Five movie studios, who all owned their own theater chains. So, finding a place that showed these obscure and foreign films was going to be difficult even without the Legion's interference. They did condemn a bunch of pre-code movies, the big one being Ecstasy, a movie where Hedy Lamarr gets nude. But once the code was in full swing, only those without direct access to Breen and his committee would dare to make a movie that would get condemned. Like, I cannot express enough how much power over the industry this organization had. They could get films banned, absolutely, but more often than not, they were preemptively censoring movies. There are versions of movies we'll never get to see because the National Legion of Decency had the authority to edit scripts. So, with so much power in Hollywood, what happened to the Legion? Why don't they still have this power? Why have you probably never even heard of them before this video? Well, the first notable blow to the Legion was United States vs. Paramount Pictures in 1948. You remember how I said the big studios owned all their own theaters? Well, the government stepped in and said that was a monopoly and that theater chains could no longer be owned by studios, leaving room for those independent and foreign films I mentioned, and giving rise to the beloved and infamous drive-in and grindhouse theaters. Man, can you imagine major studios trying to monopolize the major form of film distribution? <clears throat> but the obvious problem is societal change. Any moral panic group is, by design, gonna have a limited shelf life. And by the late 50s, the standards of the Hayes Code and the National Legion of Decency began to feel dated. I mean, they were against mixed-race couples, so yeah, they were doomed to be overthrown. So, in the 50s, filmmakers began to stop taking the Legion shit. Both The French Line and The Moon is Blue would be released in 1953, in open defiance of the Legion's guidelines. And both were named as influences in Breen officially retiring from his position in 1954. Then, in his 1957 writing, The Remarkable Invention, Pope Pius XII would say that it was better for Catholics to promote good wholesome movies than condemn the bad ones. You know, the thing people told the Legion to do right from the start. But the 60s were the real kick in the head for the Legion. Cultural standards, particularly in film, changed a lot in the 1960s. Ultimately, though, I think the Legion's death was tied to two big events. First, the introduction of the MPAA rating system in 1968. This really helped distinguish clean movies from not-so-clean movies, so the Legion's job seemed a bit more irrelevant. And second, the Second Vatican Council in 1965, a series of sweeping decisions designed to bring the Catholic Church into the more progressive 60s. The Legion was already losing support and influence, but the Catholic Church becoming a lot more progressive and the MPAA introducing a better rating system than their own really put the nail in the coffin. But the Legion kept chugging along. In 1965, they reorganized as the National Catholic Office for Motion Picture. After this, they stopped condemning as many movies and seemed to refocus their attention on actually popular movies. Rosemary's Baby, Dawn of the Dead, Rocky Horror Picture Show, and many more would end up with the once-dreaded C rating, and yet it didn't seem to hurt their bottom line. In 1978, they finally retired the C rating, replacing it with O for morally offensive. In 1980, they would connect with the United States Conference of Catholic Bishops to form the Office for Film and Broadcast, or the OFB. And that's where they still are today. Yeah, the National Legion of Decency, 
or at least whatever Ship of Theseus version of the National Legion of Decency, is still around. They review movies for CatholicNews.com, and they've apparently changed B rating to L for limited adult audiences. They're definitely a lot more lax than the Legion used to be, and... Yeah, they'd have to be. They gave Mitchells vs. the Machines, a children's film with an openly gay lead, an A2, appropriate for young audiences. But they also gave the new Saw movie the old O rating. So yes, aspiring filmmakers, you can still be condemned by the National Legion of Decency. But unlike the days of yore, they're not gonna show up to protest you. You'd have to know where to look to even know what they thought of you. I think of all of the moral panic censorship organizations I've looked into, uh, the National Legion of Decency is by far the most fascinating. They wielded immense power in Hollywood, more than any other moral panic group, at least in film history. And they're still out there, and no one talks about them. So what did we learn from all this? Well, first off, I hope this contextualizes the Hayes Code and the movies made under it. It wasn't just a strict set of rules, it was a strict set of rules with an army of angry Catholics behind it. And I think there's a lot we can learn from the Legion's fall from grace. Of course, there's the usual ways moral panic groups decay under changing social standards, but the Legion really fell apart because people just stopped listening to them. Both the filmmakers they were judging and the church they were defending decided the Legion wasn't important anymore. They were overly strict and overpowered, and eventually everyone had had enough. So they just ignored the Legion until it went away. Frankly, it's a story that needs to be told a lot more than it has been. And I can't say this about a lot of moral panic groups, but I feel like they had some good ideas. Ideas that would influence the system that helped make them irrelevant. And that's the story of the National Legion of Decency. Until next time, happy Band Films Week.